Good morning. Um, yeah, feel free to sit down. We're going to do something as in the theme of of uh, trying new things. Um, we're going to do a prayer that is uh, pre-written. Um, so I'm going to actually read it, uh, which is a little different for me. Um, but the point is, is that these are things that have been pray, pre-prayed over <laughs> for us to pray together. These are things that we, so the focus of this prayer time is that we really um, dig into the idea we are praying these things together as a congregation, as one voice to God. Um, so please uh, engage with this. Um, I'll read through it. Let's uh, just, just get in our prayer positions, whatever that is, closing our eyes, folding our hands, kneeling, uh, standing is okay. Um, we're going to focus this time on praying. God, you are the creator of everything. Even in the fallen state of the world, your goodness shines through in unmistakable ways. You made everything to reflect your beauty and goodness, and we are meant to reflect you as well. You created us and gave us your image. You provided everything that we needed and you set out good work for us to do. You are powerful beyond what we could possibly measure. Your wisdom is beyond the comprehension of our greatest minds. Your holiness sets you apart from every created thing. You are the definition of perfection. Your love is deep, wide and strong and enduring. It is beyond any love we could hope to experience from any other being. Your love is perfect, and we can trust that you will always provide what is best for us. But God, we confess that we don't always trust your love. We are like your first children, Adam and Eve. We are constantly pushing back against your guidance and authority. When pain and trouble comes into our lives, we doubt your goodness. When we see something in front of us that looks so good, and then you choose not to give it to us. In those moments, God, we sometimes think that you just don't care. We know we should trust you, and that your ways are higher than ours, but God, we fail to trust you. Father, we thank you that despite all of our distrust and rebellion, you do not abandon us. In the cross, we see that you are a father who pursues your lost children. You did not leave us to our own self-destructive ways. You came to save us and make a way for us to start over, to be reborn as your children. Thank you for being faithful when we are not. Thank you for your steadfast love that was poured out for us so that we could be saved, so that we could know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you care for us. God, help us to live in the light of your saving work. Help us to remember, especially in the moments of deep suffering, that you are a good father. Open up our eyes to see this life in perspective. Help us to see ourselves as little children who need to rely on you for everything. Fill us with joy as we catch a glimpse of the future you have prepared for us in your loving presence. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Let's say it together. Amen. Hi, I'm Hope. This is my dad. I'm going to be reading the scripture verse. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. We'll look at that. But today we're going to dive into God's word. Uh, and what's cool is, is for the first few chapters of John, we're being introduced to Jesus. Right? We're getting to know who he is. We're getting to hear John share the truth about what Jesus is going to do, the expectations that, that Jesus is going to lay out for who he is are clear in the first few chapters of John. And now there, there's this kind of, uh, there's this switch in the story where Jesus is going to begin to have 
one-on-one conversations with different people. And I think it's important for us to realize this, is that Jesus is very aware of who we are. And I think, I think you might think that's a weird concept. You're like, of course we know that God knows us. But I want you to think about, do you truly understand that God knows you? And he knows you better than you actually know yourself. One of the things we tell our kids often uh, is we help them try to process through uh, what is a feeling and what is factual. All right, we, we understand you feel this way. That's true. But what, are the, what is the truth or the facts of the situation, right? There are, we have feelings as humans, right? God created us to have feelings. And so oftentimes we feel things and we feel them deeply and they're real to us and they may just be wrong. Sometimes, I know this might hurt your feelings, sometimes our feelings are wrong, right? And, and, and we have to understand that because Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. And you see that in these conversations that Jesus begins to have with all these people because he comes to them and he's like, they're asking questions. And he, and it seems like if this happened in modern day conversations, like if you came up to me and you were like, hey, Pastor Stephen, I have a question about this. And I was immediately like, hey, listen, I know you've been struggling in this sin in your life. You should deal with that. You'd be like, what, what are you doing? Right? But that's, that's how Jesus has conversations. He goes immediately to the heart of the people and he addresses their deepest needs. And what we see in this first conversation is that. But I want you to remind you of the end of chapter two. Uh, We're in the book of John. Uh, I don't have these verses, Wendy, so you can just wait a second. But, But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Right? Jesus doesn't need us to tell him who we are. And I, I want to encourage you by that because I think there are often times where we're afraid to go before the Lord with our struggles because we're, we want to hide them or protect them or keep them away. And Jesus already knows. He's already very aware of who you are and what's going on in your life. He's very aware of what you need and, and what to expect from you. And so when Jesus enters into a conversation with us, probably when we enter into conversations with him, he's very aware of our desires and our needs and our, and our hopes and our dreams and our suffering and our pain. And we want to kind of hide that from him when he is already aware. And so we see this first conversation. And I want you to understand this. He needed no one to bear witness. We don't even need to testify about ourselves to Jesus. Jesus knows our hearts. I think you should find comfort and hope in that. Why? Because even in, a, in our deepest, darkest struggles, Jesus still wants us. Even when we feel like we don't understand ourselves or know ourselves, or we're not sure what to do in life, Jesus still pursues us. And so here he is, and it's interesting how John writes this. Verse 1, chapter 3. Now there was a man. I I like the start of this. Not because he's a man. Why? Because Jesus knew what was in a man. We're about to see this long list of descriptions of who Nicodemus was. Right? We're going to understand who he is. But that's not what John's focus is. John's focus isn't on Nicodemus' title in his human identity, his focus is on how Jesus knows him. And this is an important piece as we talk about this scripture today. Who we think we are and who Jesus sees us as are sometimes two completely different things. And so we we see this picture here. Now there was a man, not his titles, not his expectations, not who he was, because who he was was a big deal. But he... He was a man. And so we know that Jesus knows him. A man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now we have to understand some context here. All right, the Pharisees 
they were uh, what would probably look as the perfect religious people. It was the group of men who followed the law to the letter. And they were so good at following the law, they would uh, create loopholes in the law so they could uh, fulfill the law perfectly well. They would create more laws to help govern them so they followed the first laws. Like, God didn't give them the law well enough, so if I create some more laws here, uh, I can do this much better. And so they had, like, crazy discussions about things. Like, okay, how on the Sabbath, what's, what's considered work? on the Sabbath and they consider tying a knot work, right? So they couldn't come to the well and you couldn't tie a knot to put your bucket down in there and pull water out. They couldn't do that because that was work on the Sabbath. And you might be like, well, that's crazy. So, so what do they do? But they were so religious, but they were also thirsty. See, women were allowed to like tie their clothing wraps and so what, how they found the loophole was women could tie their clothing wraps around the bucket to lower it into the well. Now, they were all about following the rules, uh, and there were a lot of them. There are over 600 do's and don'ts in, in the Old Testament. And they, and they were purposely given to them for various reasons. They were good things. I, I want you to hear that. right? They were good things. They were, they were meant for God people to see how they needed God. And they were meant to bring separation between God's people and the rest of the world. Uh, to be holy means to be separate from. And so this was a man who lived by the letter of the law so perfectly, but he wasn't just a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jews which put him into a whole new category. We don't know exactly what he was. Uh, he was either a Sadducee or one of the Sanhedrin. So you're talking the top end of the Jewish political system. So see, see the difference there? Not There's a little religion there, but it was really a political power. The, the, there was politics were controlling the religion. That's a scary thought. It's a real scary thought. But he was probably from a very wealthy family that had the ability to speak into all of God's people. Here are the rules of the law, the expectations. This is how we're going to live. This is what we're going to do. And they did it so well. Like, I, I, I want to I clarify. Like, Nicodemus did his job so well that I think if he showed up today, you would fire me to hire him. You'd be like, that guy has it so much more figured out than Stephen does from a perspective of understanding how to exactly follow the process and teach other people to follow the process. This, this was Nicodemus, right? But you have to understand that when John brings him into the conversation, the conversation is not look at Nicodemus, this great ruler, this, this mighty religious leader of the Jewish people. He says, this is a man. And Jesus knows his heart. And so what happens oftentimes is we think about people, we think about who they are, and we think about their worldly titles, their human perspective. I am this person. And that's what we see in Nicodemus. We see that Jesus knows his heart. Nicodemus is a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. But the interesting thing is Jesus doesn't care about his title. Jesus cares about him. He cares about him in, in what he is. Which is why we see John focus on the man and not his station in life. And so this is what it says. This man, again, a remind, we, we, it's about the man, who he really is. Yeah, here's his title, but listen, it's about the man. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right, so we have this Jewish leader who comes at night. John is very intentional about his wording. 
night means something. What it means, I, I don't know. But I'm going to take a gander at you. From the beginning, John has talked about darkness and light. And what I think is that Nicodemus is coming from a very reasonable, thought-out process of, hey, I, it would be easier to go talk to Jesus at night because there will be less people around him and they won't see me doing it. I think John points this out to us because Nicodemus, Nicodemus is coming from this place of darkness and he's coming to Jesus to seek light. And so he's coming to Jesus to find truth because what Jesus is doing is blowing Nicodemus's mind. So you have the story before this where Jesus comes into the temple and he begins to flip tables and he drives out the money changers, right? So he obviously does some other miracles in between now and then because it talks about the signs that Jesus does. So G Nicodemus is aware of who Jesus is. He understands what Jesus has been doing and he sees it as a thing of honor and respect. Now, this is kind of a, like a good conversation to pay attention to. Uh, this is kind of how we should have Christian discourse, right? This is a very challenging but, but graceful way to have a back and forth conversation, right? Neither one of them are attacking each other. Neither one of them are throwing fits at each other. Neither one of them are just yelling at each other. They're having this open discourse conversation. And what happens is Nicodemus is showing up and he's like, Rabbi, which means teacher, like this is an honor. What Jesus has been doing has put him into a place of honor and respect. And what I think Nicodemus is actually doing is he's coming to Jesus to recruit him. Because he, he, he sees and he's like, man, this guy's teaching all of the right things. And he's saying and doing things that we have never seen before. And what the cool part about it was, is he understands that only God could have this power. Like, do you realize, like he comes out and he shows up and he's like, hey, you must be from God because you can't do these things without God. And so there is, there is some understanding of Nicodemus as he, as he comes into the presence of Jesus, as he begins to have this conversation, that he already knows like this elevated desire to, to know and understand him, right? He, he has this elevated desire to walk with him and hear from him and, and be in his presence. There is something about Jesus that has spurred the attention of Nicodemus in a way that makes him come away from all of his power and begin to submit to what Jesus has to say. And so he comes to him and he's like, man, you, you, you've done all of these things. Uh, now here's, here's the interesting part. He's, he, Jesus, Jesus never answers anyone's questions in the way they expect. We find that to be true in our way we pray often too, right? Often what we pray is, is, God gives us the right good things, maybe not the things we asked for. Uh, but Jesus answers him and he says, truly, this is verse three, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus shows up to like be like, hey, listen, I think you're a really great teacher. God has to have sent you. Maybe he thinks he's a prophet. We don't really know. But he shows up and he's like, hey, I want to hear from you. I want to see what you have to say. And Jesus immediately is just like, listen, if you want life, you got to be born again. Now, for me, it would be a little shot. Like, be like, we weren't, well, we, what are we talking about? That's not what I came here for. Unless one is born again, he could not see the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to imagine this as a, as a religious leader of God's people. And you come up to talk to someone who you believe to be sent from God himself. And he looks at you and says, listen, unless you're born again, you don't know the kingdom of God. 
He is saying to Nicodemus, you have not seen the kingdom of God. You think you know everything there is to know about coming closer to the Lord. You think you know everything it is to know about following the law. You think you know everything there is to know about knowing the Father, but you have no idea. And so this truly, truly is to say, is to say like, Nicodemus, would you just listen for a second and hear me very clearly? If you want all those things that you thought you were seeking after, you have to be born again. I want you to hear this because I think this is important for all of us, especially in our culture today. Your humanly fleshly identity has to die in order for you to have life. You must have a new life to be in the presence of the Father. You must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, He goes logical here. Uh, He's obviously intelligent. But it it seems funny to us, but he understands the situation. And his reply is, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I think Nicodemus is like, okay, I want that. But that's not physically a thing. But there's this question here, right? That he, he, he's supposed to be wrestling with that Jesus sees that he doesn't. Nicodemus is thinking about all the earthly process of trying to come to God. If I do the right things, if I follow the right rules, if I have the expectation. And what Jesus is saying to them is, no, no, you have to be born again. I want to think about birth, Right? The child has no control over their growth and of their life. That's up to the parent. They are grown without any control over their own being. And Jesus is laying this picture out of, you must be born, you must be given new life, unlike the life you have. When our lives are in confliction with who God is, it's an easy answer. God has something better for us. When our identity is not in Jesus and the life he has for us, we have to understand that Jesus has better for us. And what he's trying to help Nicodemus understand is you don't know what all these laws have done for you. They've set you up to see me and to see the life that you should have through, through me, but you're not getting it. So Jesus answers him again. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. I want you to consider this. Now, there is a complication here that we need to talk about, right? Jesus says, Unless one is born of water and the spirit. We, we know the spirit part, right? Without hesitation. We're like, when we come to know the Lord, the Holy Spirit has, has called us to that and he comes to dwell within us. So we're like, okay, we, we as Christians, but what about the water part? And this is weird because it is not explained at all. Now we can clearly see in other parts of scripture that baptism while is an ordinance given to the church, while as a command given to the followers of Jesus Christ, is not a requirement for salvation. Uh, anyone that debates that, just look at the thief on the cross. I don't think they dunked him in water before he died up there. Okay? So, but we have some instance of, of, of water, but what is often water, the picture of water in the Old Testament? What's it for? Cleansing. So I'm going to take you to Ezekiel. Uh, it's not on the screen. I'm sorry. Uh, to be honest with you, I write my sermon way after I produce all the things the church wants. Uh, so Ezekiel chapter 
36. I'm going to read it for you. If, you. if you don't have your Bibles, I'm going to read it for you. There are some around you under the chairs. It says this, And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When, the, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanlinesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all uncleanliness and I will summon. So so it goes on to talk about a little. So there is this picture in Ezekiel Right, that, that Nicodemus should understand that there is this water cleansing that is metaphorical, that God will send his spirit upon his people, which is not, and there will be a cleansing. And it's cool, you should read the story because if you continue on in the chapter 37, you get one of the most interesting stories. If, if you think the scriptures are boring, uh, you get zombies in chapter 37. You go to Job, you can find some dinosaurs. You go to Revelation, you can find some dragons. Uh, you can, there's all kinds of craziness. If you're bald, I recommend 2 Kings chapter 2, 20, verses 23. Uh, it's a good one to pull out just, just to keep safe if someone ever says anything about your baldness. Uh, the God is God is creative and funny, and his creation is amazing. And what God can do is beyond our imagination. And so we get to this moment in John and we and we see this mysterious water. And the reality is, I think, I think it's this picture of cleansing that we see throughout the Old Testament. Uh, but we we don't get we don't get perfect clarity in this passage. I want you to understand there are times in scripture where we can assume, and that's not good exegesis. And so we, we know it to be there, but what he says to him is, he says, listen, unless, unless the Spirit comes upon you, you're not going to see the kingdom of God. What he says in Ezekiel, unless, unless I wash you clean and the Spirit comes upon you, you're never going to experience life in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the presence of the Creator, And so there's this, there's this conversational piece that he's having with Nicodemus where he's saying, this is what it takes. You have lived by the rules your whole life and you have not found the kingdom of God. If you're walking with the Lord and you feel like you're lost, my guess is you just need to listen to the Spirit. I'm not questioning whether or not you're saved. There are time, have been times in my life where I'm like, I, I just can't hear God right now. And like I pray and I weep and I cry out and I'm like, God, I'm trying to listen to you. I'm, I think I am. And am, is there a sin in my life that I'm not seeing? Right, that happens. But if you feel like you've never entered into the presence, if you feel like you've never heard God, if you've never felt the presence of the kingdom of God, I would encourage you to go before the Lord and make sure that you know who Jesus is that you do believe what he has done because that is when we find new life. See, we what is born of flesh, Adam and Eve passed that along and what is born of flesh, what is natural to us? I'm gonna blow your mind, ready? Sin is natural to a broken world. Even the, even the idea of saying I've born this way is natural to a broken world. Right? But I want you to hear clearly Jesus' words. Unless you are born again, unless there is new life, unless your identity has changed to that of which Jesus has given you, there is no kingdom of God for you. And I think we struggle with that as Christians, but because, like, this is who I am and this is who God created. No, you are who God says you are. And you are who God knows you to be. And so that's what he's trying to, Nicodemus has all of the understanding of the Old Testament and he's trying to say, you're just, you're missing the point. You're going to find life and it's only going to be found in this new birth. So 
Jesus doesn't give Nicodemus time to respond. Because I, I imagine that at this point, Nicodemus has all kinds of questions. He has all kinds of expectations. He says, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. I, I love this. Because he's like, hey, uh, listen, you don't understand earthly things. And he's not talking about non-God things, right? He's, that's not what he's saying. Because Jesus, God is present with him in that moment. He is literally having a conversation with God himself. What he is saying is, he says, you, you have not seen all the things that God has laid out on this earth for you to understand. And if you can't understand those things, how are you going to understand all of the amazing things God's going to do that's beyond your imagination? When we are looking for God to perform miracles, but we're not seeking Jesus, you're never going to see them. When you're looking for God to intervene in your life and your desire is for Jesus to show up and do something, but you have no desire to have a relationship with Jesus, you're not going to see anything. God's not going to give us more when we don't take the bit he gives us. And so Jesus just answers him and says, listen, you don't get it. So how are you? Because I think the idea for, for Nicodemus, now, the cool thing about Nicodemus is you find out later uh, he, he still remains a Pharisee and he begins serving Jesus, right? Uh, so there's, there's a redemption in this story. Like Nicodemus gets it and he stays where God has called him and put him to serve there. Ah, light, light in that darkness, right? But Nicodemus doesn't see the simplicity of what Jesus is doing. And I, I think we often can easily miss that. We can easily, I think we can generally say Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, God, the Father, God, the Holy, God, the Holy Spirit, God, Jesus. We can all say all those things and we can say they know better than we do, right? God knows better than we do. And then we can say, well, but does he? This is kind of new trend. Kind of like social media. I I follow lots of different things on YouTube that are like biblical teaching. And every now and then I'll get a random weird video that's talking about someone's crazy beliefs, uh, which are fun. Because I'm like, whoa, how did you, how'd you get here? Uh, but there's this, this, there's this challenge uh, that this pastor gave. Of like, God doesn't want you to understand all the cultural changes. He wants to restrain knowledge from you. He doesn't want you to know all the wonders of, of his works and he doesn't want you to understand this. Now, you might say, well, God wants us to understand. I want, to, I want you to take this challenge and I want you to think about it. Right? This, is a, this is happening today where they're like saying, God doesn't want you to know who he is and all the things he is. He doesn't want you to become wiser and smarter and intelligent and understanding. Do you remember when this conversation happened? When did this conversation first happen in the creation of the world? In the garden. What was Satan's conversation with Adam and Eve? God doesn't want you to have knowledge. What if you were like him? God already made us like him. We were his image bearers. And he created us to dwell in his kingdom at all times. And we died because of our sin. And so only through being born again through Jesus can we have life. And they don't see this or understand this. And he doesn't know this. And what Jesus is essentially saying is, listen, the spirit moves as he wills. But you can't understand the simple things God has laid out before you. Don't look down at Nicodemus because I think we're the same way. And I think it's time in the word and it's time in prayer and it's time with ironing, sharpening iron moments. Like men, if if you want to go meet with John Pape, like if you believe that six o'clock is a real time. Uh, I went to a six o'clock men's group when I was 
first to pastor. And I went for like, it was several months. And what I realized was like, I would, they would play this like video at the beginning and I'd fall asleep during the whole thing. And then we'd get to the small group time where I was supposed to be like leading conversations. And I'd be like, how's it going? Uh, I just wasn't cut out for it. Right. Like I try, I tried. And I finally had to like tell the senior pastor, I was like, listen, dude, if you want me to run this at night, I'll gladly do it, but I cannot function at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was falling asleep in my desk at work after that. Uh, and, and so, but, but that kind of intentional getting together with other people and sitting before the Lord that lets us begin to see the kingdom of God in new ways and deeper ways. That, that intentional time where you're opening up God's word and allowing him to speak to you. The Bible is incredible. It has amazing stories and amazing things. And there are going to be things in here that you're like, I don't understand that. And that just might be a mystery that God will explain to you one day. Or it may be that you need to go to another brother and sister and walk with them so they can help walk you through that. That's healthy. It's like if God gave us an example of the early church and he set it up, he'd probably be like, you know what? You should read the Bible and you should pray together and you should get together and study the Bible and you should eat together. Like if we did that, Acts 2, 42, right? We should be intentional about keeping it that simple. And so if we're going to see the greater things of God, we have to be pursuing God. And so he says, you don't know these things. The spirit's going to move and you're not going to understand it. And that's okay but you got to understand what God has laid before you. So Nicodemus says, verse nine, how can these things be? Right? Like he's like, I, I know all the Old Testament. And now you, you're changing things. D- Jesus isn't saying anything new. This is not new and it should not be new. So Jesus challenges him. Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? I don't think he was being mean or sarcastic. I think I would have been sarcastic. Like, dude, you call yourself a teacher? That would have been my response. Remember, I said use Jesus' example here when we're talking to other Christians, not mine. Right? So he says, how can these things be? Are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not know? You do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And so now we have Jesus essentially saying, I am am God and I am present and you're, you're missing it. Now, here's the cool thing. We're going to, we're going to kind of stop here. Because we're going to hear the answer. And I, I want you to understand, I hope that you, I really just hope that tomorrow or next week, I said tomorrow, next Sunday when we gather together to worship and, and we talk about the most famous verse in all of scripture. My hope is the verses that follow John 3.16 are known to you because the world knows John 3.16 and they stop there. And one of the things you have to understand about the gospel is the gospel message is very clear that we are fallen, sinful, broken, dead people. There's a lot of times where the gospel is just presented as you got to let Jesus live in your heart. Okay, that's not biblical at all. We have to understand and see that we are people who are our very nature is sin. And God knows us. And even in his knowing us, he, he still loves us. Like that's the beauty of God, right? Because think about your like worst moments. Okay, imagine them. You're going to share, you, who wants to come up and share them? No one? <laughs> you, I saw some volunteering of other people. That was nice. Uh, no one, right? We don't, we want, we don't want to, Jesus knows that. Jesus knows all of our hurts, all of our brokenness, all of our pain, and he still desires to come down. And so he did. And he still desires to pursue, so he does. And what he desires of Nicodemus is the still same thing he desires of us. He says, I know your heart better than you do. 
and your worldly identity doesn't matter because I have a new one for you and it's life and life in the kingdom of God. But in order to do that, you have to see your sin. He's trying to get Nicodemus to understand that all of the rules and all the laws that he followed were not enough. We have to see that we are sinful people. We have to understand that in order to find life, we have to believe that Jesus went to the cross to bear our sins. And on that cross in the shedding of his blood, we are washed clean. And we believe that there is new life because Jesus rose from the grave. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to live in us and walk with us. But what's required for us is to see our sin and repent. We do none of the saving just like the baby does none of the birthing. The baby does all the pain and discomfort, right? We do all the pain and discomfort. Jesus does all the saving. And that's what he wants Nicodemus to see and understand. All of these laws that you follow were set in place for you to find me. And here I am. And the beauty is we get to know that Nicodemus' story becomes one with Jesus. So when Jesus shows up and he says, I know you, I don't care what you've done. I want to I want to free you from your sin and I want to give you new life. What do you say? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and our opportunity to worship together. Lord, we're, we're going to kind of move into a new time, right? That we're, we're learning new things. We're experiencing new things. God, but we want to see, see us as you see us. We want to let you into every point and place in our hearts, God, that you would, that you would, that you would look to the deepest most innermost beings of us. And we would hear your voice and we would hear that you have cleaned us of that and we no longer have to allow it to control us or lead us or guide us. Father, we want to understand what it means to be born again. We want to understand and live that out because God, we get to be part of the kingdom of God and God, we get to share that with others and God, we get to pursue you like never before. And so Father, as we as we go about our time together as we continue to have some time of worship through through prayer and through song and God would we just be a people who doesn't say hey look this is who I am and this is all the things I have to do give to the world we just look at a people and say Jesus we know that you know us how can we live in you And so, Father, help us draw nearer to you this week, today, tomorrow. And help us celebrate new life in Christ that we've had for maybe one moment to 50 years. And may we, when people show up in the darkness to find light from us, may we be the voices that share the truth of Jesus. And Father, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind you kind of what we're doing here. A little different. It's going to feel maybe awkward. It's okay. All right, I'm going to close us with who you are. I, I love this passage. I've read it to you before. I, 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 I like to remind you of who God calls you to be. Uh we are going to have some more worship and our prayer team is going to come forward and be up here and there's going to hopefully be some prayer stuff up on the screens for you. Uh, if you feel like, hey, I, I need to go or you, hey, I need to have a conversation with someone or, hey, I want to bring my kids up to come worship the last couple of songs, all that you're welcome to do. Uh, but after I close, we're going to have two more worship songs that are just, it's here for you to come before the Lord. Uh and it's okay if you say, man, I'm really, really hungry and I want to go. That's okay. All right. Feel, yeah, yeah. I feel it. I feel you. But I, but I want to, I want, we want to make this time about Jesus. Like I'm, I try to honor your time, but I'm like, there's a little of me 
There's a lot of me, I'll be honest. It's like, I'm just going to preach until God tells me to stop. Because I want to I wanna hear from him and I want to share what he shares with me with you. And so I want to remind you as we close here, who you are. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Father, we thank you that we are your people. And we thank you that we can walk knowing that you have chosen us and we can live in your mercy. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.